Hi, and welcome back to the Wellbe Show and podcast. Today, I am thrilled to have Dr. Michael Ruscio with us. He is a doctor, clinical researcher, and best-selling author whose practical ideas on healing chronic illness have made him an influential voice in functional and integrative medicine. His work has been published in peer-reviewed medical journals, and he speaks at integrative medical conferences all over the world. Dr. Ruscio also runs an influential website and podcast at drrusho.com, in addition to his clinical practice, which is located in Austin, Texas. Michael, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I can't wait to pick your brain about all these important topics. A big focus at WellBe is gut health, but I really haven't zeroed in on the gut microbiome in utero and also with, you know, new babies and children and the differences in how you might approach, you know, improving your gut or gut optimization um, as an adult versus as a child. And also things parents can do or people thinking of becoming pregnant or already pregnant uh, to ensure good gut health before they even, you know, have the child or before the child has any control over what they eat, et cetera. So thinking about the earliest stages, what can mothers do during pregnancy to ensure good gut health for babies. And I have to caveat by saying I'm asking this because I'm pregnant right now and, and, and doing a lot of reading on what I can do to create a baby with a strong gut microbiome. Sure. Well, this is one of the, the sections in Healthy Gut Health You is early life factors and how they influence gut health in, in children. And this does extend to your point all the way back to while the, the child's in utero and developing. And just as one example of, of what the research literature has found, they looked at different women who either had no contact with farm animals, had contact with, I think it was um, one to two or two to four or four to six. And for every additional grouping of animals that mothers had contact with, they found a corresponding decrease in the level of inflammatory and immune mediated condition in the offspring, which showed to the researchers that even while mom is pregnant, her exposure to dirt in the environment, and this is within reason, I wouldn't say you know, a dumpster would be the kind of dirt that we're, we're trying to contact. So we have to apply a little bit of logic to the statement, but what we might term old dirt, um, you know, animals, forest environments, uh, naturally occurring germs and bacteria and such, that seems to tune or attune the immune system of the mother and the child. Uh, so that gives us a, a bit of a hint in terms of what can mothers do to help improve their gut health and the gut health of the forming child. One thing would be contact with a natural environment. Uh, so not being kind of a germaphobe, again, within reason, right? If you go to a public bathroom, probably don't wash your hands. Um, if you're hiking, uh, and you're getting in touch with, with dirt, or if, if you're in contact with animals, that's the type of exposure that's probably going to be more beneficial and tuning to the immune system. So that's one thing that we can do is just have whatever reasonable degree of contact we can with a natural environment. There's also a dietary um, you know, facet, which, which I'm sure you've probably discussed in the podcast, a whole foods diet, uh, making sure that you're getting in sources of iodine would be important, not so much for the microbiota per se, but for neurological development, which I'm, I'm sure you probably covered somewhere. Um, and also omega-3, uh, you know, getting your, your fatty fish in is another important factor. Again, not so much relevant to gut health, but important just to mention. Another intervention that would be squarely toward gut health, probiotics. And this is where there's actually some really exciting literature. And I think it's something important for mothers to be aware of because what sometimes happens, uh, at least according to my observation in the conventional realm, when a conventional doctor, let's see, a, let's say an OBGY is not familiar with the body of literature, they'll just revert to, well, don't do anything. And, and you'll see, actually, my, my sister just had surgery and she was told, well, stop taking the probiotics. And I checked in with her two days later and I said, how are you doing? And she said, I'm really, really constipated and gassy. I said, well, are you taking the probiotics? She, she said, no, my surgeon told me not to. I said, All right, understandable. If they don't know, they're going to revert to nothing rather than potentially something that could be harmful. But there's great evidence that in, in certain models of surgery that 
taking probiotics can improve recovery rates and definitely probiotics have been shown helpful with gas and constipation. So she starts taking them and two days later, she said, I'm pooping normally again. So the same thing kind of happens with, with mothers where they may be told, be careful with probiotics, but there's actually some very interesting evidence showing that children birth from mothers who are taking probiotics while pregnant and or while breastfeeding have less eczema as one example. Uh, so they're, they're safe and effective for mother and for child. And they've even been shown probiotics that is to be safe and effective for kids in the neonatal intensive care unit. So even children who are really, you, you could say sensitive and perhaps not thriving, this is where probiotics can be helpful. So, uh, you know, a few dietary notes, contact with your natural environment and probiotics are a few places to start. And there, there's, you know, a lot in this conversation, but those are maybe um, uh, you know, a few of the main pillars that mothers can concern themselves with in trying to produce the healthiest kind of gut environment that they can for the health of their child. Great. Okay. I'm like, check. I'm taking a probiotic. I am trying to, you know, get good dirt. Uh, I think I'm doing a lot of the things. So that's great. great. So there have been studies that have identified that babies born vaginally as opposed to uh, via C-section typically have a more diverse microbiome. However, we understand that methods of delivery isn't always in a mother's control, obviously. So what are some ways that parents can ensure that their baby's gut health is really being supported, for example, after a C-section birth, or if the child had an infection and had to be treated with antibiotics, you know, really early on, like even a couple of days or weeks or something right after they're born? Uh, if there's something like a, like a C-section birth, then you may want to ask for a vaginal swab. And some hospitals are doing this, some, some are not. Um, but there's some evidence showing that just a swab of, of the vaginal fluid, because it contains a, a wealth of bacteria, can actually be just taken over the child. And that seems to prevent some of the loss of, of the bacteria inoculation you get when the child goes through the, the vaginal canal. So that's one option. And then probiotics, you know, again, would be another in, in contact with the natural environment if the child has to use a antibiotic. And this is something I also write about in Healthy Good Healthy. You're just trying to kind of give people, here's the framing of the argument and here's the risk. Because one of the things that I think we want to be careful to do more in, in the alternative medicine camp is not make these absolutists, like you can never give your child an antibiotic or it's going to ruin their gut for the rest of you know, that, that sort of absolutist fearful narrative it shuts down thinking and, and almost no choice is going to take you from zero to 100 on the spectrum of risk. So it's important to understand that so that parents don't logically and kind of emotionally just revert away from using antibiotics, especially if it's a case where they may really be needed. Now, the other side of that coin is you want to make sure that you're not indiscriminately using antibiotics and thankfully, this is something that in conventional medicine seems to be reformed, or at least it's strongly being reformed, just not giving kind of antibiotics out willy-nilly or prophylactically. So you want to be looking for your doctor seemingly being discerning in the use of antibiotics and make sure that you're asking them, you know, is it really essential that they're used here or now? Can we wait and see? If so, what's the risk? So just you know, make that calculation just to make sure you're not getting a doctor who's a little bit more flippant with the use. I think most now are not, but you know, there, there's always some who maybe still are operating under a, a more antiquated paradigm. But if you do have the antibiotics, again, it's not the end of the world. And, and I talk about, uh, again, Healthy Good, Healthy You, there was this uh, great analysis of, I believe it was a, a hunter-gatherer tribe in Papua New Guinea, and they were in uh, access of conventional medical care and would be administered antibiotics on occasion when whatever sort of condition popped up necessitating antibiotics. And they found that their microbiotas were still vastly healthier than most Westerners' microbiota. So even though they had antibiotics, they still looked much healthier than their Western cohorts. And it's likely because they had a much kind of healthier or dirt rich environment. So that supports the position that antibiotics aren't the, the one thing that's, that's going to irrevocably change the, the child's gut health. Um, now, the earlier the antibiotics are used, the, the more impactful they may be on the gut in a negative way. 
So we want to, again, be discerning, but there are other things that you can do, namely using a probiotic and trying to get contact with the natural environment as much as you can as kind of safeguard. So I hope I'm not giving you too much information there, but you know, there's, there's kind of a lot there to unpack. And if you have to use one, you can use one, just make sure you're, you're um, doing it in a justifiable way. And then natural environment contact and probiotics are two great ways to help prevent some of the damage, or I shouldn't say damage, some, some of the imbalances that, that antibiotics may, um, you know, may cause in the gut. I think you're optimistic about how many doctors are still, you know, giving out uh, antibiotics kind of loosely, I think, um, from just what I've seen and heard from some friends with kids. And um, and the other thing that's interesting is a lot of people are accessing these city MDs and, um, you know, more like these little clinics, because especially during COVID and these other things, it was just hard to get into an actual doctor, right? And so it's not your doctor, it's a doctor. And so, and it's a very conveyor belt medicine style thing. So I think in those, in those situations, um, it's probably easier to get, you know, an antibiotic and, and, and also there's a sense of covering yourself, you know, I think it is changing too, but you're just, I think you see the better in people than me, maybe <laughs> thinking that. Well, yeah. I mean, all the more reason for, for the parents to be kind of engaged and just, just ask questions and don't underestimate your logical problem solving ability and, and just ask, you know, how much risk does whatever you think going on poses? Is it something that typically resolves itself? And is the antibiotic being used to maybe reduce some of the child's suffering for a couple of days? But, you know, typically that, you know, will they self-resolve as if it's a gut pathogen, oftentimes gut pathogens are, are self-limiting. So these are just things that you want to ask and, you know, try to get a better understanding from the doctor. And the way the doctor answers your questions gives you a lot of information. If, it's, you know, if you get any of that kind of scoffing, then that's a pretty big red flag. If, if someone seems to be listening, you know, now this is granted, you're asking the question <laughs> in, in like a tactful way. So, you know, that's the other side of the equation. But as long as you are, then even if you're not sure how to interpret their answer, it's how they answer your question that sometimes can be a red flag for if someone's taking you seriously and listening and caring about your concerns or if they're not. Definitely. Yeah. I'm a, a board certified patient advocate and I'm not sure if you knew that, but um, that's a lot of what I advise people is that you can read between the lines and just how a question is answered, but you have to start with respect in order to get it right. So if you start in antagonistic way, you're probably not going to get Right. you know, something lovely back, but I agree with you. Uh, that's a great way to kind of tell how somebody thinks and kind of, if they're going to be dogmatic. Yeah. And I love that you brought up that, you know, the integrative holistic world can be dogmatic or absolutist as well, because that's my biggest pet peeve across all, you know, the sides of medicine, conventional and otherwise is the dogma. It doesn't have to be that way. You can measure risk. Right. And, and so you know, like antibiotics, no antibiotics and make a decision that way. It's not all, you know, good, evil type of black, white uh, thinking. So I'm glad that you brought that up. So you mentioned obviously probiotics. Can you take us a little bit deeper into different kinds of probiotics and how they work and when they're most effective and when they're not? And also, you know, how do we determine the best probiotics for our own body? Because I think a lot of people just hear, just take a probiotic and there are big differences in quality and obviously big differences in the type of bacteria that's in each one. And of course the amount and type of bacteria that's in us as well. And it wasn't until I really, you know, worked with a naturopath and, and looked more specifically at my own needs that I got a bit more targeted information on the type of probiotic I should be taking and the amount of, you know, parts per billion or whatever that were in each one and how much you really need, et cetera. So if you could extrapolate on that, I think it would give people a lot more information about, you know, okay, I want to take a probiotic. Now what? Sure. Well, let me start by saying that, that my position on probiotics is, is probably different than what you may hear in, in most places. And this would include with, with naturopathic uh, physicians. And I think it's important to acknowledge why and, and where that comes from. But one of the things I've observed with probiotics and in, in, in the field is, uh, unfortunately, natural medicine and functional medicine is following conventional medicine just with a different peril. Instead of 
pharmaceutical companies, there are the nutraceutical companies who are really influencing education. And when that happens, and you trace that back a few steps further, what you see is that when a company makes a probiotic and then they fund a clinical trial, which is a, a wonderful thing in science that we, we need, unfortunately, what ends up spawning off of that is now the company declares, well, this is the best probiotic for X, Y, Z, because we have the clinical trial and understandably so for that company, that's a piece of marketing clout and they, they're proud of that and they wanna educate about that. But what ends up happening is, you know, there, there's this mistaken thinking that that probiotic is the best probiotic for that condition. And these companies won't disclose, but oh, by the way, a different probiotic showed benefit for the same condition. They're not gonna tell you that. So what ends up happening is this, this kind of market pressure to prop up one probiotic as the best for depression, another as the best for constipation, another as the best for kids. And when you look at the probiotic literature, you'll see this trend of, well, you know, there was one probiotic that had a clinical trial for constipation, just as an example. But then six months later, a different probiotic also found benefit for constipation. And then a year after that, there was a clinical trial comparing two different probiotics, and they both found equal results for constipation. And the same thing for depression um, and the same thing for, for children probiotics. You'll see that different formulas have been used in um, the, the various clinical trials. So instead of getting wrapped into this is the best formula for XYZ, or you need this specific strain or species for ABC, what I've come to see as a result of clinical reflection is that we can really break probiotics into three different types and then personalize those three different types to the individual. And the analogy that I use is a stool, uh, yeah, as in a chair that you would sit on. So the stool requires legs in order to balance. Now you can look at the, the stool as your gut microbiota. We want it balanced. We don't want it to fall over into imbalance. So one probiotic formula is akin to one leg of support. But if we can use three different formulas, now we have three legs of support encouraging and holding the gut microbiota in balance. The three different types of probiotics, three different categorical types, that pretty much all of the formulas on the market that have been used in the clinical trials organize themselves into, generally speaking, are your most traditional form, which is a combination of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium species blends. This is something akin to your VSL-3. It's the oldest probiotic on the market, the oldest type. There's over 100 clinical trials using this type of probiotic. The second type is actually a healthy fungus, and this is Saccharomyces boulardii. And there's about uh, 50 or so clinical trials with uh, this type of probiotic. And again, it's a healthy fungus, and it's been shown to help in a, in a multitude of different conditions. And then third and finally, there's this newer probiotic, kind of the, the, uh, the golden child of, of the paleo and ancestral health community. These are your soil-based probiotics. Uh, this is something, uh, prescriptive cyst was a formula, there, there's megaspore, there's soil-based probiotic. So that's the, the third type. And there's about 20 to 40 studies on that, depending on what body of literature you look at, finding benefit in, in various conditions also. Why this is important and why this is relevant is because the consumer is confronted with a, this is the best probiotic for that. And there, there's all these competing marketing claims on the internet, but what underlies that is a selective citation of the science, right? We're gonna tell you that our probiotic is best because of the references for our probiotic. We're gonna not tell you about the competitor probiotic that showed something similar or the other competitor or the other competitor leading you with this dizzying array of options and no unifying philosophy for what seems to be the best way to use probiotics is having the highest species count that you can. The more species tends to be the, the more beneficial effect. And this has been shown in a few of the review papers for IBS as one model, meaning when researchers look at one species or two species as compared to 10 to 15 species, there is a trend where the more species equals the better result. And so that's essentially what I'm continuing with the three category system so that an individual can try one category, see how they feel. If there's partial improvement and they need more resolution, they can go on the second and even go on the third to try to have the most kind of all encompassing three 
legged support for their microbiota. And that's what I found to work uh, vastly better than one probiotic alone. And it also gets you through kind of the maze of all these claims that people are getting peppered with. Got it. Wow. That was uh, very helpful and very in-depth. And, you know, from some previous interviews and just my own research and knowledge, your advice about probiotics mirrors advice about your diet to strengthen your gut as well, right? Like a more diverse diet with tons of different kinds of plants and fiber is going to yield uh, a very strong gut and, you know, a stronger gut than, than if you didn't. Um, and you want to have as many different kinds of good bacteria as you can. So it really makes sense, right? That you would want to have a probiotic that has a lot of different species uh, versus just high amounts of one, because otherwise the dietary things that we've heard wouldn't make sense. And, you know, all of that. So on the dietary side and just uh, thinking about children. <laughs> um, I guess this applies to adults as well, but, you know, picky eating is a challenge among children. Um, there's a reason there's a kid's menu and, you know, everything has to be kind of bland and when they can choose at least chicken nuggets and, you know, white, you know, all sort of white foods and things like that. French fries. Can a diverse diet offer the, the right amount of gut health support for kids? Or do you recommend just because children tend to be more picky eaters that all children are taking a probiotic? Or is it really just if you've had, you know, the mother had to, or the child had to take antibiotics or something like that, where you, or, you know, was a C-section baby that you recommend starting on an actual probiotic supplement when kids are young? I don't think it's a bad idea to have any child on a probiotic, just, just looking at the benefit that's been shown in the trials and, and no real detriment. Um, I don't think probiotics are a bad thing to, to at least have as something you're using in kind of a loose on-off application. You don't have to be anal about it and, you know, take them on vacation with you and chase down your kid if, if they missed a dose one morning. Uh, but as, as a general kind of replacement for the fact that we don't get enough exposure to bacteria to begin with, uh, you know, I think it's a good hedge to have in place that is, is really low to, to no risk uh, and, and some benefit. So it seems uh, worthwhile. In terms of how could disruptions in the gut microbiota map on to picky eating, I don't know. That's not something I've actually looked into directly. I'm not sure if there's been any research done there yet, but I wouldn't be surprised to find that poor or suboptimal gut health could in part underlie picky eating. Some of this could be genetic. Sure, I don't want to just make it all about um, gut health per se, but seeing in adults that when people have disrupted gut health, they become more selective in what they eat because they're more food reactive. It would hold that that same thing could be happening in children, but they just don't have the ability to describe what's going on. Meaning I think I'm lactose intolerant or I feel tired after I eat this. They don't have that ability to really express that. So I wonder if in part the picky eating is a learned behavior secondary to the fact that certain foods aren't sitting well with them. Like people with IBS oftentimes avoid higher FODMAP foods because they notice a negative gut reaction. So I wouldn't be surprised if there was a degree of that found. And then in tandem with that, um, you know, a, a fair part of this is likely just desensitization of the taste buds, which seems to be something that, that happens pretty quickly with children. If, you know, if, they're, if they're given unhealthy food, many of those foods are made to be so addictive that they can kind of skew in a, in a certain uh, unhealthy uh, palate. Um, so I'm assuming most of your audience is probably attuned to that. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, those are a few things that you can consider with, uh, with picky eating. And then to the, the other part of your question, it, it's a partial misnomer that we, we have to eat a really broad, vast array of fibers and fruits and vegetables to have a healthy gut. It is true that diversity in the gut correlates with health, but it's a mistake to think that it's a one-way street, meaning you feed your gut bacteria, they become more diverse, you become healthier. And this is evidenced by, by the, the you know, fairly compelling body of literature that's found that those with irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, and inflammatory bowel disease, they actually get worse in many cases, not all cases, but there's a strong trend that those cohorts get worse with too high of a fiber intake. And this is, this is one mistake that has, has really come out of the, the interest in the microbiota. It's this mistaking kind of reductionistic thinking that it's this simple straight pathway. 
feed your gut bacteria, they're more diverse, you're more healthy. And in some cases, you do that and there's more inflammation and there's a flaring of disease activity. And this is likely because it's not as simple as just kind of force feeding the microbiota. Think of it kind of like a garden. It's almost like saying, well, the more you water a garden, the healthier it's going to be. You know, there's a point at which too much water becomes a problem. And it, that may be different for every garden, right? A garden with lots of sun exposure may need more water. A garden in a slightly cooler climate with lots of shade will likely thrive on less water. And this is kind of the, the bio-individuality piece that's been left out of much of the, the microbiota narrative. And it's been kind of uh, whittled down to this really reductionistic thinking of you know, feed your gut bacteria, and then they're going to bloom and you're going to be healthier. And that's the opposite of how it goes for some people. Diet quality is really important, the quality of your food, but it's not indiscriminately tied to the fiber content of your diet. Very interesting. We, we had a an interview with doctor who was all about, you know, the more fiber you can get. So it's great to hear a different perspective on um, how, you know, bio-individuality plays a role in that case and how it could just be too much maybe for a, a imbalanced gut to handle throwing like a lot of different bacteria at it, you know, at once. So I, I appreciate that doctor's perspective and that perspective is not necessarily wrong. It's, it's just, it, it's the most correct when you're going from the standard American diet, which is high in sugar and high in processed foods and low in fiber, you know, uh, principally. But when you go into the, the realm of healthier diets and you kind of have this range of, let's say you're going to do a, a low carb paleo, probably the, the lower fiber end of the spectrum and a Mediterranean or vegetarian diet on the higher end of the spectrum, those have all been shown to be health promoting. And it's a, it's a real sad misnomer when, when we position any facet of diet as just push it as far as you can in one direction and there's no sweet spot. It happens with carbs, it happens with fats, it happens with fiber. And I, I would really, you know, with all due respect to the other guest, I, and I'm not sure how he or she was contextualizing this, but I'd really caution the audience with those sorts of arguments because those are typically a byproduct of someone who's, who's too enthusiastic about a hypothesis because there's almost always contradictory data. And what ends up happening when we focus on all the data that says what we want and ignore that what we don't, the people who needed this advice are harmed by that. Because now, and this is what I see a lot of in the clinic, people come in just getting bloated and having constipation or having diarrhea and having the resultant fatigue as a byproduct of that. And we'll have them go, let's say, on the low FODMAP diet, which reduces prebiotics and fiber. And in a month, they come back feeling dramatically better. And they go, I, I just read so much about fiber, 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 fiber. And it's like, well, that's not necessarily untrue, but it's, it's not true for you. And, and with all the inflammation that was going on in your gut, that fiber is actually feeding the bacteria that the immune system was acting against. And so you're actually kind of provoking a system that was turbulent. Um, so anyways, sorry for the kind of diatribe, but it, it's really important because it's, it's, you know, those people are disturbed by that kind of unilateral messaging. I actually totally agree with you. Um, I was, I, I liked his message because um, it made me and I think a lot of audience members think about how many different plants they were eating in a day, right? You know, you just yeah, kind of get on autopilot with yeah. what you buy at the store right. and what you might put in a salad. And so it helped me to take a salad with five ingredients that I had a couple times a week and make it 15 ingredients. Cause I just started like throwing more in and, you know, so that was great, but I agree with you that there, you know, it didn't leave a lot of um, explanation for, or caveats for when someone like their gut just really can show them they're not doing well with beans or with grains or with these other, you know, things where it's more nuanced. And then you really have to understand what's going on in their gut. And it's not just an across the board thing. So I, I really do agree and appreciate that. So you mentioned, you know, some of the, the things that harm our gut, lack of access to nature and, and good dirt, uh, certainly a lack of a diverse diet. What are some of the biggest threats to children's microbiome specifically today? And what can we do to kind of mitigate 
some of these threats for those that can't be avoided, you know, how, how best to, to deal with that. I, I know obviously taking a probiotic is, is helpful, but you know, there's just a lot of different things that impact the gut. So I'm thinking about, you know, all the different threats out there and what are the biggest. Sure. Well, yeah, I don't look at children really much differently than I look at adults. So, you know, all the same things that adults do are, are important. Sleep. It's been shown that disruptions of sleep rhythm actually have a negative impact on the microbiota. It's been shown that exercise actually improves the health of the microbiota. So there's this bi-directional piece where the diet influences the microbiota, but so doesn't the health of the host. That's kind of the point I was driving at earlier, that it's not just a one-way street between, you know, the microbiota impacts the host. There's also the host health impacts the microbiota. And so this is where it's exciting to see things like in studies where those who were sedentary started exercising and their microbiota was mapped all along the way, the health of the microbiota, the, the diversity actually improves when one starts getting exercise or when there's a disruption of the sleep rhythm that also causes problems with the microbiota. Time in nature has been shown to be healthy, not only due to the um, bacteria that are, that are vectored, but there's also this, this body of research that has shown that people who live near oceanic or forest environments or spend more time in those, they actually have a lower all-cause mortality, meaning a lower chance of death from any cause. So there's something therapeutic about nature, including but not limited to the microbiota. There's also some evidence showing that exposure to the sun and or vitamin D levels have a positive impact on the microbiota. Uh, it, it's, that's our, it's earlier data there, but it makes a lot of sense when we understand the, the vitamin D immune system connection and that part of what allows your microbiota to be healthy is if your immune system is properly tuned. Immune systems that are too overzealous, they tend to not get along with the resident microbiota, the resident bacteria. So you, you have the bacteria and the immune system that houses them. And in some cases, the immune system is attacking. This is, this is a hallmark of inflammatory bowel disease where there's actual autoimmune attack against the resident bacteria because the immune system has just kind of lost its aim and it's starting to kind of shoot at everything, so to speak. So that's where the vitamin D and sun exposure connection sort of ties in. And, uh, you know, the health of the diet, and, and, and I appreciate that point of um, your, your other guests of trying to encourage people to eat the broadest diet that they can. And that, that is the aim that we want to get to, just, I guess, honoring that, that, that broadness may vary from person to person. But for children, um, yes, you know, that, that broad diet and making sure things are nutrient rich and not processed is a, is a big step. Uh, and yeah, I mean, those are, those are really some of the main hallmarks in addition to trying to use antibiotics um, as discerningly as possible. And, you, you know, you're, you're well on your way towards you know, a, a healthy gut health by implementing that kind of holistic approach. Great. Okay. So you talked about when the immune system is kind of overzealous and attacking things, and it makes me think about food allergies and food sensitivities. They're just obviously becoming so much more common for children today. It, it seems like a new one that's very serious pops up every day. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, it just seemed like you were told about nut allergies and that was it. Now there's just so many. It's just, it's very clear that something is wrong in our environment rather than there's something wrong with all of these different kinds of foods. So what are some of the most effective ways you can test for and identify, you know, the real root causes of different food allergies and sensitivities in children, considering that specialty and elimination diets are already hard to follow for adults and then for children seemingly, you know, even more challenging. Right. Well, it depends on what type of allergy you're, you're trying to test for. If it's the, the anaphylactic kind of emergency reaction, the IgE mediated, then that's, you know, probably just going to your, your allergist and, and having the kind of older school blood testing and or skin uh, patch testing uh, should be sufficient. That's probably not what most people need help identifying because those tend to be fairly obvious in, in how they manifest. For the other types of tests that, you know, maybe my child doesn't do well with dairy. Maybe they don't do well with grains. Um, this is where perhaps you could food allergy test, but I, you know, I ran food allergy testing in the clinic for a couple of years and it, it just does not seem to be highly effective. You know, there is some data 
that has shown benefit in a kind of clinical setting that food allergy testing can help someone more quickly identify what they're allergic to. So there's some evidence, but what ends up being found is the foods that are most typically avoided are the ones that the testing is showing pose a problem, like dairy, gluten, soy, what have you. The other part of this that, that's complicating is food allergy testing only gives you maybe one third of the type of food reactivity someone may have. Someone may be intolerant to FODMAP content, meaning they may not do well with high FODMAP foods, which is you know, a, a really important aspect of the, the gut diet modification for a, a fair subset of people. In fact, the, the, the British Dietetic Association in their guidelines for IBS management recommends first starting with a general kind of food quality and, and um, junk food elimination diet. And if that doesn't resolve the symptoms, they don't recommend food allergy testing. They recommend trialing of a low FODMAP diet. Um, and it's because a low a FODMAP intolerance won't show up on a food allergy test, nor will if someone's sensitive to fiber. You know, if some people eat too much fiber, they may flare their digestion. This is one of the most common things I think any clinician working in gut health will see is that you know, fiber can kind of cut both ways and, and too much can be problematic. There's also dietary histamines that for children especially seem to cause uh, tantrums and mood problems if they consume too much histamine. That won't show up on a food allergy test. So I think the food allergy tests give parents a false sense of security regarding what they should be eating. The other thing that also complicates this is the, the more compromised your, your child's gut health is, the more likely you're going to see what's known as a false positive on the food allergy test. So when I had a gut that was a mess in college, I had 23 foods I was allergic to. I wasn't really allergic to any of those foods, but I did have a major inflammatory problem in my gut causing me to develop what's known as acquired intolerances. Essentially, my gut was chronically leaky. So my immune system started reacting to many foods because my gut was just like a sieve letting things through that, that it shouldn't. And so all those food reactions on, on the ALCAT test I had 15 or so years ago, those are, none of those foods are, are foods that I have a problem with today. But I had to go through the exercise of improving my gut health so as not to have those uh, reactions. So yeah, I, I think if used responsibly, perhaps they, they offer some utility but with the fact that food allergy tests are anywhere from $500 to $1,000 in a lot of cases, and they miss a few of these things that will thwart you from getting to where you want to be, I, I just, you know, me nor any of the doctors at, at our center really have gotten behind the use of food allergy testing. Yeah, the more I have asked people about testing for things related to food, the more I believe that it's very incomplete, inaccurate to, to get an actual test uh, for a lot of food things. And so it is a bit of elimination and experimentation to understand what that is. And some people might feel like because they prepare their food for their children, it's easier to control, but others would say, I can't get my kid to eat, you know, things that are on this elimination diet or whatever. Um, so that would make it harder. But I, I agree that going to an allergist and then getting a test and being like, Oh, well that solves it, you know, is, is really not gonna cut it. I think one or two other things are, I, I should slip in is when Performing dietary restrictions with children, we should really be as light-handed as possible. There is some evidence showing that overly adherent dietary practicing in children leads them to have more issues with food and the relationship with food like orthorexia or um, you know, binge eating when they get older. So in the clinic, I'm, I'm very light-handed with the recommendations. And I also try to never frame things in, in a pathological way for children. It's, you, know, oh, you can't eat this, Tommy, because it's going to inflame you and it's going to make you sick. I try to really frame it as, you know, this may help you feel the best and this may be what your body runs the best on and just avoid any language that has a negative valence because we don't want kids starting to internalize psychologically like there's something wrong with me. Um, so I think that's, that's a really important uh, A and, and B would be, I try to lean more heavily with children on supplements. Now, I try to really be a diet first sort of provider, but with kids, it's harder to get compliance. 
And it's easier for them to start to fight you. And it's also easy for them to start to build up these neurotic relationships with food. So I'll try to get more out of something like probiotics so that hopefully they have more tolerance and they start seeing some of the symptomatic improvement. And as one aside, there's been many trials that have found that in children, lactose intolerance demonstrably improves after using probiotics. Just as one example, it's not all about probiotics, it's just a good starting point. Um, so those are things I'll try to push on more so that we don't have to really fetter the children with either the psychological burden or just the logistical burden of uh, having to be you know, any more food avoidant than we absolutely have to have them be. Oh, interesting. I, I really hadn't thought about that. And I know quite a few adults now who had food allergies and things like that, and they do seem to have a fearful relationship with those food categories or just with meals in general, or how am I going to navigate this gathering and not being able to eat this or that, or is it going to be awkward that I have to say this or bring that? So the fact that you're thinking about that is great because, you know, it means you're really caring for the whole person, not just their gut, but their psychological well-being as well, which also has an impact on the gut. So it's all very connected. Also on the topic of testing though, what are your thoughts on testing as far as stool testing and GI mapping for children? Do you think it's necessary or do you believe that similar strategies or just understanding symptoms and then making assumptions based on that can be utilized in order to rebalance the gut of a child who you know, has an imbalanced gut without expensive or fancy testing? Yeah. I mean, with, with kids, you know, again, I think we need, need to be really careful about not having them do any stuff that's non-essential because we don't want to lead them into that paradigm of thinking that they're ill or they have to avoid foods because there is such a thing as nocebo, right? If we start putting these expectations in the heads of adults, just like children, they can start to, so nocebo is the manifestation of a negative uh, outcome where placebo is a manifestation of a positive outcome. They're, they're the other you know, side of the, of the coin. So yes, testing in some cases, but it's, it's much, much more rare. Here's an example. You could do a SIBO breath test and a GI-MAP stool test, of which I, I like you know, the, the SIBO breath tests are generally accurate. The GI-MAP is a good stool test, but you can resolve SIBO with probiotics. There have been 24 plus clinical trials now that have found that probiotics as a standalone therapy can remedy SIBO. So do you need to test for SIBO if the probiotics can resolve it? And could you just monitor someone's symptoms and see if their symptoms are improving that likely tells you that the labs would improve? Seems reasonable. Uh, and most of the findings in a GI map can also be rectified by probiotics. Probiotics has been shown to be anti-Giardia. There have been studies looking at probiotics head to head against antifungal medications and finding equivalent results. Probiotics are anti-H pylori. Um, so, I mean, there's the exception of if, if a kid presents with what seems like a parasitic infection, which is, you know, acute and frank symptomatology, perhaps, but the idea of starting with some gentle dietary changes, right. You know, kind of general food quality and sure, you know, if, if there's going to be ice cream and pizza tonight, have the indulgence, like let the kid live like we'd want a healthy adult to live. My aim is for no adults to reclude into this living like a nun, but it's being healthy baseline and then being able to have those, you know, you know, excursions where you go out and you have a dessert and you have, so we'd want that same thing for a child, but try to you know, get the rest of the diet as healthy as we can. And then layer in something like probiotics. And there's a few other things that you may want to trial enzymes, immunoglobulins, and see how far you can get their gut health just by feeling around with the natural and safe interventions that we have. The thinking that we have to do, uh, you know, testing up the wazoo for every person to then use oregano oil, probiotics, enzymes, and immunoglobulins, it's silly and it, it hurts people. You know, it subjects them to way too much cost. And then they, they go and they look up every bacteria that they find on, <laughs> on the GI map, many of which are dysbiotic, meaning they may be a problem, they may not be a problem, but they'll find the worst interpretation of a paper on the internet and you know put that in the back of their head and now all these things start building up and, and there goes the psyche. Um, so no, for, for children, you know, use of testing is, is really selective 
And just a reminder that so much of what we do in natural medicine is, is safe and doesn't need to be guided by a lab. I appreciate kind of that, that impetus to be scientific and to document pre-post, but too many providers are functioning more like researchers than they are clinicians. And this is something I think conventional medicine does pretty well. They will oftentimes not do a test if it's expensive or, it's in, or if it's invasive, and they'll just do an empiric trial of the treatment. And I think this is the evolution of where natural medicine is going to go next. You know, there, there's been enough scientific documentation of a lot of what we do. And now the, the you know, serial testing and retesting is something that can be left more so for a research setting or for selective cases that have kind of failed out of all of these great natural interventions that we can navigate with an individual. I agree with that. It's a rabbit hole. If you go start to go down all the different functional medicine tests that you can take and things like that. And, and often the, when I have done them, it very rarely ends in some sort of clear action. You know, it, it's more, it ends up being a little bit more nice to know than it is a roadmap to then plan out the next treatment or the next action in your, in your healing protocol. So I think that's very interesting. One part of that, that I had a question about, and this uh, was a different question I wanted to ask you if a child is on like a gut healing protocol, right? Like they've, they've, it's very clear. They have a lot of different symptoms and you're trying to heal their gut. Um, they obviously have to be stricter or more restrictive than if they were, you know, already went through it, their gut was healed. They could obviously have some, ice cream and cake here and there, but it's not going to destroy everything versus if they're, you know, in week two of a three week, you know, gut healing protocol, you know, do you think like that? Do you think a child can, can do that a gut healing protocol and, and, and really have to be restrictive in that no, phase? Or do you still no. feel like you should yeah, kind it's of, a, it's a great question. I'm glad that you're posing it, but what ends up happening when, when we create such, such, you know, rigid strictures for individuals is long-term compliance goes down. And I also haven't found that one or two deviations, um, let's say you're doing antimicrobial you know, herbs, I haven't found that an occasional deviation from the diet is going to be the difference between success and failure. Now, this is under the one caveat that you don't notice any fairly marked food reactivity. Like some people are really sensitive to gluten, and it's like, okay. You know, you have gluten and you feel it for three to four days. Okay. So, you know, we've given you the freedom to learn on your own. And now based upon that biofeedback, it's fairly obvious what you should do. That's the healthy way. The unhealthy way is, oh, you can never have any gluten because it'll upregulate inflammatory cascades in your intestines for six months. And now people are just avoiding gluten on faith. And they've never actually tried to see, well, what should my relationship with this food be or with dairy be? Uh, or what have you, so that I know what my level of reactivity is, and I can eat in a correspondent fashion. I think it's a mistake that we have to be so ardently uh, strict during during these these cleanses or whatever it is, uh, and I, I just don't see it happen in the clinic. And, and this is one of the many things that we're, we're challenging in the clinic is, you know, how um, how steadfast do we have to be with some of these you know recommendations? And much of this is a lot easier than you would think. Uh, so no, I, you know, I give people some leeway. Now, now some people are really type A and they, they enjoy kind of like just being really organized, but some people, it kind of crushes them and they feel like, oh gosh, like I'm a really social person and I love food and sure I have some bloating and I have some uh, loose stools and abdominal pain, but I also really love a glass of wine and ice cream. And could they do that once per week on a probiotic intervention? Yeah. And would that be the, the make or break? No. Would it be the make or break while on antimicrobial therapy? No. Would it be the make or break on you know an elemental diet? Probably not. Um, so I think we can make natural medicine a lot easier for people. And I think we're, we're holding people to this standard that it just doesn't need to be held. And, and the patients who come in with you know their, their Excel table for their dosing, it's like, where is this coming from? You have 15 different doses throughout the day. And you know, these things add up. And they start to really harm people. You know, the two thousand dollars worth of testing, half of which may be complete bunk. The seven diagnoses that you have because of that, half of which are bunk, that are weighing you down. The strict diet, the Excel table of supplements, like this is really harming people. And there's a lot of good here, right? But if we just get rid of some of the excess 
maybe one discerningly used test, a relaxed iteration of the diet, a dosing regime that's twice per day. Now you'll get to a similar outcome, but the experience and the cost for the patient will be vastly different. Well, it's very encouraging to hear that you are seeing good gut healing results um, and symptom resolution results in your clinic, even when somebody, um, you know, does have a night of wine and ice cream a week or something like that, because it was my perception that you couldn't really do that in the beginning if you wanted to have a successful, a successfully healed gut. What are the other things you've seen that have been really successful in your clinic um, for people with gut symptoms or just symptoms they don't know are related to the gut? Well, well thank you. And, and I should also mention, because sometimes when I make that remark, uh, I'll hear later about a uh, provider, you know, maybe like in the chat section who goes, well, I see chronically ill patients. Well, we do too. <laughs> we see really, you know, in some cases, chronically ill patients. And, and usually we've seen someone who's bounced from gastro to ND to acupuncturist to integrated nutritionist to ND to gastro again, and then they come and they see us. And in some cases, this is not all, but, but it's enough where it's, you can clearly see it. Just having some relaxation in how their care is being vectored leads to a huge improvement in how they're feeling because they're just under this huge weight of restriction and fear and worry. And when you can just lift that for them, a lot of healing just opens up. So, you know, I, I don't mean to be uh, critical of the field just for no reason, but you know, these are real people who are suffering for years and years sometimes. And so, you know, I think we need to be more mindful of the weight that what we say and how we say it, you know, the weight that, that carries. Um, but then the, to your question, Aminoglobulin therapy is something that's very interesting, uh, as is elemental dieting. Uh, aminoglobulins are essentially a supplemental way of taking the immune membrane or the mucous membrane that, that lines your gut. And you know, these capsules or powders, they make their way through your intestinal tract. And what they do is they, they bind to LPS fragments or fragments of bacteria or certain toxins. And you can think of this as if a bacterial fragment is like a shard of glass, it could kind of irritate the lining of your gut and, and cause this inflammatory reaction. And immunoglobulin is like taking that shard of glass and wrapping it with wax and making it unable to kind of cut or irritate. Uh, so kind of like deactivates them from an immune perspective. Uh, so immunoglobulins are one that have been interesting and also elemental dieting, which is uh, a liquid meal replacement that's hypoallergenic and starves bacteria and probably also starves fungal overgrowths and reduces antigens or foods that your body's reacting negatively to uh, in this kind of pre-digested liquid hypoallergenic formula. Uh, those two have been you know, helpful for people who haven't really done well with more of the frontline therapies, the various diets, probiotics, and then maybe some type of uh, antimicrobial therapy, whether it be berberine, allicillin, oregano, what have you. Um, for people who haven't seen optimum results with those, uh, elemental and immunoglobulin therapy can um, you know, be quite helpful in those cases. Okay. So it sounds like some diet change is necessary, but not completely restrictive, plus this sort of herbal supplementation and, and enzyme supplementation and things like that. You seem to be most effective. Yeah. I mean, diet at the core and, and typically we'll start with kind of standard elimination it's something like a paleo framework that gets rid of or reduces, you know, generally speaking, in a you know non uh, fanatical fashion, common inflammatory foods. And if that doesn't work, we'll try a low FODMAP application. And then from there, we'll go to, we call it probiotic triple therapy. That's the three different probiotics used in synergy. And then from there, we'll kind of reevaluate, see how they're doing. And oftentimes, we'll next go to either elemental dieting in a, in a short stent as a couple-day liquid diet reset uh, or to antimicrobial therapy and kind of end the line with immunoglobulins. And that's a typical hierarchy that we kind of work through. And, and that hierarchical kind of step-by-step -step thinking is really helpful because what I see in, in probably the majority of patients, especially the ones that have kind of bounced from doctor to doctor, is they're, they're looking for the one thing. And they don't have kind of like a long game perspective. Well, if we can pick up 20% from diet, 30% from probiotics, 20% from antimicrobials, and then round the corner with another 20% with a finishing touch of an elemental reset, then that's your personalized plan. But 
why it was eluding you is because you were, you were trying these things haphazardly without this kind of let's weave together a personalized plan for you that, you know, that seems to work and, and do it in kind of a methodical stepwise fashion. Yeah. I do always uh, recommend when people haven't been taking probiotics before or are trying to use them therapeutically for a symptom, like give it a real shot, you know, like meaning don't miss for two weeks or, you know, something like that to see if it has an impact. Of course, nothing seems like it's going to work if it's done kind of so sporadically and without any tracking or awareness, because it's too hard to know, you know, it's the, especially with natural interventions, they're not going to be as, you know, powerful or as noticeable as a uh, antibiotic, for example, on, you know, stopping a symptom. And so how they can be successful is that if you do them consistently, you know, they'll actually work in the long run. But I, I have seen that a lot of people say, oh, I tried acupuncture for that thing. It didn't work. I said, well, what, how, how did you try it? You know, well, I went to this place and I'm not even sure if they were licensed or whatever, but I did like two sessions in two weeks and then I got really busy with work. And like three months later I went back, but anyway, right. it just didn't yeah. work for me. And you're like, well, that's about as uh, loose of a <laughs> treatment right. plan I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well um, said. Well said. So, you know, that applies to all, all different kinds of natural interventions. So I agree with you very much that it's like not worth trying unless you have a little bit of a structured plan around it with which to measure yeah, did yeah. some improvement happen, you know? Yep. Um, all right. Well, we're coming up on time and I really appreciate so much of what you shared today. Just, just a wealth of knowledge in this area um, and some very different perspectives, which I really appreciate because I am very anti-dogma, uh, both in conventional healthcare and in the natural medicine world. And I, I hate absolutes. And I know there's five sides to every story. And it's, it's really great to hear different perspectives within the natural medicine world and just in general. So I appreciate those. One final question since this, this interview was really, uh, you know, focused on pediatric gut health versus just, you know, great gut health in general, but there's so much overlap. Does the gut really change from, you know, being a child to being an adult or, or is it really just, you know, once you are eating foods that are not breast milk, you, you have a gut microbiome and, and good bacteria and bad bacteria and everything else is coming in. And then it just grows as you grow or, or does it have to be treated differently? Uh, well, so th there's one key difference in that the the gut microbiota and the impact it has on the immune system is predominantly formed by the third to the fourth year of life. So there is this really important kind of pivotal formative window that we should be concerned with. Um, but beyond that, you know, the way we tend the garden that is the gut it's really quite similar for adults uh, and children. So no, th there's not a demonstrable change, but there is this maturation. And you know, the younger you are, the more important these things are because it, it sets the stage for formation. Um, but it's really important for me to say that even if you were a kid who say wasn't breastfed and was C-section birth, it doesn't mean that you're, you know, you're cast into this category of gut health that cannot be remedied. You know, I'll, I'll tell uh, you know, the people we work with at the clinic, we can do a whole heck of a lot with what we have right now. So don't worry about what happened in the past. We can't do anything about that. And you know, there's all these great therapeutics that we have that can support your gut and give you that little push here or there that you need to get back to balance. I'm so glad you said that because we brought up C-sections and, right. you know, not being breastfed and stuff in the beginning. And, uh, I, I would have hated for someone to listen thinking, Oh God, now I'm, I'm really screwed, but yes, it is rectifiable. You just have to do extra work, right? It's like anything. If you have some sort of, um, injury or you start out a couple steps behind others, you know, catching up, uh, you have to just do a little bit more maybe. Um, and it's not that impactful for everyone. That, that's the other thing that's important. It's not to say that there's this 100% correlation between those who are cesarean section and, and IBS. It's just, there's, you know, a couple percentage points more of an increased risk for that, but it's, it's not like a 70% jump. And that's the other thing that I think is really important. The field tried to do a better job with is, is assigning a level of risk to an association. Because oftentimes people hear, oh, like, you know, there's more inflammatory disorders with C-sections. Like, yes, 
but it's, it's, it's a pretty small increase. You know, it is an increase and it's not chance. So the stats show that it's a legit finding, but it's not like a, in, in many cases, it's not a big over 50% chance. Oftentimes the, you know, the, the probability is something in, you know, the single digits. So that's, that's really important to mention. That is really important to mention. I'm glad you said that. Um, do you offhand know the probability of, you know, symptoms or conditions related to the gut later in life for breastfeeding as well? Is like one a bigger risk than the other? I don't. It's been a couple of years since I've, I've really gone through that literature in an in a intense fashion. And at that time, you know, as, as an admonition of how I think we're all learning and evolving, I didn't fully appreciate what's known as effect size a few years back. And I'm really over the past couple of years coming to understand that effect size, meaning the magnitude of the risk or the association, really important for us to disclose. One I'll share, a little bit unrelated, but it may be interesting to your audience, is that when, when people have Hashimoto's or, or the thyroid antibodies, uh, the, the, the best study that looked at this only found a 9 to 19% association to actually becoming hypothyroid. And that was really enlightening for me because oftentimes people who are diagnosed with Hashimoto's, this, this autoimmune condition of the thyroid, they think it's a guarantee that they're going to become full-blown hypothyroid. But there's actually only you know, less than a 20% chance that that will happen. And so you know, I include myself in that criticism of the effect size. And so now I'm trying to really bring that forward into all the messaging. I apologize. I don't have that offhand for the C-section or the breastfeed. That's fine. I just thought it would be interesting given that you knew the C-section was in the single digits if breastfeeding was as well and kind of could somebody who had a C-section delivery breastfeed for longer as a way to try to like catch up, you know, and, and repair some of the, I shouldn't say damage, but, you know, to mitigate some of the increased risk that having that C-section then had. My gut reaction is that is that breastfeeding for you know, a certain amount of time or as long as possible is probably more impactful just because you're getting That's sure. so much, you know, of the woman's antibodies and the gut flora and everything else that she has. Um, but who knows? I absolutely don't. So we'll have to find that statistic for everybody listening at some point. All right. Well, Michael, thank you so much for sharing all of this. Um, where can people find you? I know I mentioned um, Dr. Rousseau.com is your website in the beginning. I know that you've also written a book on gut health, I believe. Yeah. DrRusher.com is my website. It's uh, D-R-R-U-S-C-I-O. And the book is Healthy Gut, Healthy You. Uh, we have a podcast. I also have a clinical practice with myself, a number of other doctors and the research staff. And, and we're also doing research and publishing uh, what we find in, in uh, peer-reviewed medical journals because we're really trying to lead the charge, you know, to whatever extent we can in, in rectifying some of these wrongs. And that's all available through kind of like the main hub of drrusher.com. Great. Well, thanks for taking the time and uh, have a wonderful day. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it.